At Journey, there are so many things that we appreciate and love, but one of those things is vulnerability. It's the willingness to lean into a story without trying to fix someone, but to recognize that there's a tension in, in people's lives, and the tension is creating something. This is my friend Kevin Dixon. Hi, I'm Kevin. <laughs> Let's try that again. Hi, I'm Kevin. Hi, Thank you. Good. There you go. Yes. Wow. Did you feel loved by that? Very, very Good. much. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so this is, we're, this is a wrap-up today. We, this is just our question Sunday. So there's a number that will appear on the screen, and you can text in questions. And Kevin and I have a lot of questions. We're going to share questions together um, and it kind of explore those. We, what we've been, we've been doing this as we, as we come to the conclusion of a series or kind of a season that we've been teaching to go, hey, what questions have emerged? And we may or may not have answers to them. Most of the time we won't. But we might have questions too. Let's talk about the questions. We, yeah. might, we might parlay some thought or two about them. But, yeah. but we'll join you in those questions and recognize that, as Kristen so beautifully said, it's, it's in the tension of struggle that we often learn. So sometimes we've got a question. We just want to have it resolved quickly. But actually, the question needs to kind of go do its work. Actually, the great gift of the question would be to, to sit in it and wrestle with it. And yeah. All those things. So if, you're, uh, if you've been at Journey for a long time, uh, this has been really hopefully a review of, hey, this is who we are. This is our DNA. This is our culture. This is what this tribe kind of looks like and what we value. If you're new to Journey, then hopefully some of this has been meaningful. And if you're exploring and looking for a church that you might connect with, I, I hope this gives you a little flavor of who we are before you jump in. Why don't I open with a couple of passages from Scripture, and um, I'll give you a chance to say any op opening words. Okay. And then, in the meantime, if you have questions, in particular, some of you have been with us for the last four or five weeks. If you put any questions in a journal or in your phone, you're like, oh yeah, I wanted to, this was a thing that kind of came up. Fire those in. They're going to go to Kevin. He's going to filter them. They don't trust me to filter them because yes. I don't we'll filter Just leave much. it there. So, okay, all right. Okay. We've been in our four core expressions. That's, four, that's what this is about. This is about our four, our four core, core expressions. expressions. Thank you. Did that's it seem like I was drifting already? No, you just didn't mention that. I just oh, I didn't? Mention okay, all right. It. Yes, four core expressions. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. First John chapter 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is pretty central to our understanding of God. That God is not uh, just an abstract, but that he is love. He's the groundedness of all being, and in that is all personhood. God is love itself. When you participate in love, you're participating in God. And the moments that you go dark, or, you, or what we, we call sin, anything that... But this is our understanding from the Bible. Sin is anything that breaks the flow of relationship with God. So anything that disrupts that and puts you in darkness, that love pulls you out of it. God's love doesn't change. Our perception often changes of whether or not we're loved. But God is always there. He remains because he is love. His love is not contingent on our behavior. God is love. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, if you go, hey, could you give me an example of when maybe most often I drift out of love? When do most people kind of drift out of love? Well, here's kind of where it happens a lot. Matthew chapter 7, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, let me say a quick word about that. Uh, in the church upbringing that I was brought up in, this was kind of taught a little bit more like karma. Like, if you judge, that's, I'm just saying that's kind of how it was. Yeah, like, if you judge like this on Thursday, like, Maybe. next Tuesday, it's coming around. It's coming around. Yep. So, that's what kind of, don't do that. Yeah. Our interpretation of this would be, hey, if you judge in that very moment, you're bringing judgment upon yourself. Because the act of judgment in condemnation, and that has an energy to it, is actually darkness. It's not kindness. It's not love. This is not making a healthy evaluation. It's not giving someone feedback out of love. This is different. You, in, in mo if you pay attention, you can tell the difference in the energy when it comes to judgment. I'm condemning you. Jesus says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Uh, Paul writing that about Jesus. And, and then Jesus actually says, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. So... 
And then Jesus, in order to drive home this point, tells kind of a joke. This is, a, this is like an ancient joke. In the very next line, he says, hey, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log cabin in your own? <laughs> and the people have been on the hillside like, that's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, good hyperbole. Yeah. How can you say to your brother, take the speck out of your own eye when there is a log cabin right here? You can't even see. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, thank you. Yeah. And then, you hypocrite. Yeah, thanks. I'm just reading scripture. Oh, yeah, well, okay. Time means everything. Wow, I know. Today. It really killer. is. That worked it's out killer. well. Thank you, God. Oh. Matthew, I'm glad you added that. You hypocrite. Take, by the way, I think this is playful. I, yeah, I think even yeah. in the original, like, just like you, hypocrite. Yeah. First, take you, hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own, the plank out of your own, the plank. Where am I? Oh, yeah. Take the there plank out of your own eye. Oh boy. And then you will clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so I love this because he's really saying, like, this is the nature of where we drift. This is an easy sin moment mm -hmm. to come out of God's love because you want to condemn or judge someone else. And then in, in order to frame up, because you might go, if I, we're, I'm in relationship. I mean, we're, we're having conversation. Aren't you sometimes giving people feedback? What does that look like? And he goes, and say, don't give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under your feet, or worse, turn and tear you to pieces. Have you ever given feedback to someone who wasn't really ready to hear it? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. You're, 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 I have. <laughs> I said no. I was going to say, you're no, really never. tuned to that. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and here's this final thought, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. So the contrast to this whole thing is, mm -hmm. and this hopefully, this is certainly the culture we desire to have, we don't want to always live it out, but that we would then, rather than leaning forward with condemnation, identifying what's wrong in you, we would instead go, hey, actually in a spot of humility might I ask and might I seek and then might I trust that God's going to bring awareness. And then we can give each other feedback out of an energy of love, but after we've done some internal work, after we've checked out what's going on here. And of course, the difference is in the energy. If, if there was one, somebody asked me this recently, hey, if you could summarize like one thing that's really not okay to attorney, we said, well, it's just not okay to shame people. And unfortunately, religion has been full of shaming. Romans 8, chapter 1 says there, this is the first I was quoting, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Brene Brown talks to uh, sort of shame researchers. Researchers, she talks about this at length. You are imperfect. You are wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love and belonging. And this, this is something we're called to. We recognize that struggle's part of the deal, but it doesn't mean that God ceases to be love. Mm -hmm. And we're still worthy of that love, and we're still worthy of belonging. And so the invitation is to enter love. And it's an invitation as opposed to your right, fix your life, and then some demonizing, shunning, and shaming to help drive the point. We see that as the contrast between living in healthy community and getting lost in unhealthy religion. So there's the summary of Journey. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Are we done? No, no, I mean, uh, okay. do you have any thoughts? Yeah, here's one. Oh. Um, <laughs> I actually think this kind of dovetails with this. Okay. this. This speaks to, I think, the series that we just, you just did in, in, in a good way. It says the church, the church seems very permissive, which is good in one way but concerning in others. When push comes to shove, does Journey believe that the Bible descri describes absolute truth? So they're connecting absolute truth to this idea of permissiveness. And I think, I think if you got, that's where you've got to take our four expressions all together. Put them together. Because if you don't put them all together, if you just say, we trust God in you, and we kind of left it at that, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, that, that's permission to do whatever you want, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. um, but the other reality is, is that part of our culture as a church is, is that um, there's freedom. <laughs> and in that freedom, we believe that God works in freedom. Um, he invited us into a relationship and said, I will set you free. Um, and, and what does that mean in reality is that 
I'm, I'm going to have relationship with you in such a way that I'm going to walk with you. But he also said, I want to put you with a bunch of people, and they'll refine you, and they'll, they'll be a part of your life, and they'll speak into your life. Um, and I think uh, part, of, part of our attention, part of our understanding of how church works is even if we wanted to control behavior, we can't. Um, the only way we could is if we shamed you or guilt you. And, and even that's temporary. Right, and it's, it's uh, the only word that's coming to mind is icky. Um, <laughs> that's good. You know, that's probably good. Right. So the other word might be a little too much. Right, so that's yeah, good. right. We just leave it there. Yeah. But, um, and so what feels like permission actually is freedom. Um, and what um, we invite you into in that freedom is as you share your story and you become vulnerable and you become transparent with a group of other people, the opportunity exists for change. And the truth that comes with that is of Jesus in a person as well as the Bible. And, and those things come together. There's a, a freedom to either engage it or not engage it. Some of us just live in denial our whole lives. That um, we are people, this is who I am, this is who I always have to be, and, and we run roughshod over people or we hide from people. We do a bunch of different things and we just settle for that. And what we're saying is we're gonna give you the freedom to be transparent and join us in this journey and give you permission to work out all the icky stuff in your life. And we're, that we, yeah, no, that's really good because I, we're really saying we believe that God is the Father, not us. Now that doesn't mean the church isn't a mother of sorts, because in a way we are. We come around in community and, and mm -hmm. there is an opportunity. If, if there's destructive behavior and we see it as such, Call it out. We go, hey, can we have a conversation yeah. about this? Because we see this as destructive. And <clears throat> but the, the energy is not an energy of condemnation. It's an, honor, it's an energy of love. And that for us is the difference. It, this is not a church absence, absent of feedback. This is not a church absent of boundaries. This is not a church that we, 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 I actually think it causes us to fall in love with the scriptures even more because we're entering the tension. Because the Bible never quite behaves the way you want it to. Have you ever noticed that? There are all these questions about the Bible that you go, well, no, that doesn't exactly, how, I know, well, how, what about that? And it, and it leaves you in this place of preventing us from creating little idolatries. And that's <clears throat> one, of the, one of the first teachings for the Jewish people was to not make God into any kind of a graven image. But a lot of us turn God into an intellectual image. So we have our own intellectual idols of God. And we frame, we put a little doctrine and dogma around it and we kind of build a little argument around it. And we're talking about God. Mm -hmm. But we, at times, come across with this energy like we're all knowing of God. And we've, we've created an intellectual idol that we, and then we'll stand and defend. We're saying God has revealed himself and we're getting to know God. And he is a, an, a, a deep mystery and an ever-present reality. Somehow we live in the tension of both, that we're gonna plumb these depths for all of eternity and he's right here right now and we're in the midst of love. So in living in that tension, we feel like it's giving us an opportunity to be in relationship with a God, not in obedience to an abstract post-enlightenment value system. I'm sorry, I got lost in these questions. No, you just um, <laughs> come back whenever you want. With some really good ones. Um, I think this one follows up a little bit on what we were talking, what you were talking about, about judgment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and can you speak to the difference between judgment and wise discernment? Yeah. Um, they give us a scripture, tells us, scriptures tells us to guard our heart or not hang on to mockers or fools, to test every spirit, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing, beware of false teachers. So where is the healthy balance between judgment and discernment? Yeah, we're all evaluating all the time, right? We're all bringing, we're, you're evaluating this way someone drives, you're evaluating the way your burger tastes, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're, we're, there's always this kind of evaluation. The difference to me is always, let's use, I've used this before because I think it's an easy one, go to a waiter or a waitress, you're evaluating the effectiveness of their job. And you can tell the difference of when your heart shifts from light to darkness with your waiter. <laughs> Can't you? Can you tell the difference? I can. <laughs> 
And when you, when you go, this is now very hellish. Yeah, I should not say anything right now. I shouldn't talk. Right, because this is going to be bad. Yeah. I've moved from yeah. uh, it judgment. It shifted. Yeah, yeah, everything moved. It's yeah. energy. It's, and I use it in the metaphor of energy all the time, but I'm trying to give you, pay attention to what's going in here. Because the truth is, Kevin might go, I'm going to bite my lip and not say anything. But the judgment's all over his face. There's a dark cloud of energy emanating from the corner booth. Like, he might be like, well, I didn't say anything. Yeah, but it's still happening. You know, and... and that's the motive. That's, that's the heart. That's, it's overflowing. Ha- yes. It's overflowing into your face. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. You're no longer the image of God. Disdain is about you. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I'm good at it. <laughs> so in that moment, what happened? Sin took hold. It disrupted the flow of intimacy. And you might go, well, the waitress really, the waiter was really an idiot, and he didn't do his thing, and whatever else. But what? So you might go, this is. You might have. You might be a really high sense of justice person, or whatever. And go, <laughs> go. This isn't right. Okay, it's not right. And I'm not going to tip them. <laughs> but you are here because we've talked about that. But yeah. Right? Right. Are you working on that? Yeah. You're supposed to tip anyway. No, this no, is no. the way we show right. up. Okay, good. Yeah. Not, you were using that as like a general thing. A general thing, okay, yeah. Okay, not personal. Uh-huh. Actually, I'm the, a pretty good tipper. This is from a few months ago. I was like, hey, when people are bad, tip them anyway because yeah. what a picture of love. Yeah. And by the way, this is a perfect example because this is how Christ loves us. Yep. We really blew it. As waiters yep. and waitresses, <laughs> yeah. we do. We blow it as servers every day. And yet, the nature of the kingdom is to be unconditional in your love, to love your enemies as yourself. In that moment, you've made that person the enemy. They didn't do this right. So, yes, apply and apply your evaluation, apply your discernment. But the difference is, it's a kingdom upside down. It's why the waiter or waitress who's struggling being a single mom, we have no idea the stresses she's dealing with, or the waiter who's trying to, be, trying to make it as a musician and all he's had was rejection all day, we have no idea what's going on internally, is suddenly they get this tip that they weren't expecting and suddenly they get this tine- kindness in the face of their unkindness and they scratch their head and they go, who's that? Mm-hmm. What happened there? Oh, that was an interaction with Christ. Yeah, that's good. And then, what, how do you discern um, wisdom? When we want to move towards judgment, mm-hmm. our natural inclination is to judge. Mm-hmm. Um, when do you see, or how, what's the difference between, we, we called it boundaries last yeah, time, yeah. Um, is where do you see boundaries different from judgment? The first thing I would say, when it feels like feedback you want to give another person, the immediate start would be just as soon as you're like, I gotta tell that person, go, where's a mirror? Mm -hmm. Just get a mirror quick and go, oh, I'm gonna tell them. But before I do, (laughs) okay. Let me check in. I, I think that's the premise of Jesus' teaching. Yeah. It's, by the way, it's, it's the story of the prostitute that's brought out in Scripture when right. Jesus goes, hey, he's without, first, without sin, cast the first stone. Right. So I think first do a check-in here right. before you want to give someone else feedback. Right. But, the, but the word, to me, a boundary is a little bit different than offering feedback. The boundary is going, it, it's always about you, like, yeah. right? It's, I, I can't make someone else do a thing. Right. You're not going to talk to me like that. You're right. not going to do a thing. Right. No, I can't control that, but I can say, hey, if you're going to be in that behavior, I'm going to remove myself. Right, that's different. So in the community of a church, we've had to at times go, hey, we see this as a destructive behavior. The other person might say back to us, well, I don't. I have freedom in this. And we'd go, okay, we, I hear you acknowledge your position, but collectively in our community, we see this as a destructive behavior. Well, I don't. Okay, well, we've got a point of tension. Let's bring another person in here. Matthew 18, if you've got a problem with a brother and you can't get resolved. Hey, we see this as destructive behavior. We think this is going to be hurtful to you or to your family or to your village, which is a small group. And, and we enter it, and this is, this is a type of boundary saying, hey, for our church, we think this is going to hurt. Yeah. So we've got to put this boundary. Well, you, you're wrong. We could be. But we've, we've come together and 
collectively made some decisions on what boundaries will function. And so yep. we, you can, if you want to remain here, you we're going to have to come into some kind of agreement, negotiate, whatever. If you don't, it's okay. The kingdom of God is broad and wide, and there may be another fellowship that doesn't see it the same way we do. Yeah. Um, Jesus was a divisive figure. You're going to love this one. Jesus was a divisive figure in his time. In these modern times, as we are being called to be as divisive, are we being as called to be as divisive as he was, or are we being called to be accepting, especially as it relates to sinful lifestyle choices? So it kind of feeds mm -hmm. off of that last question a little bit. Um, I love the statement that Jesus was a div divisive figure in his time. I'd and like, is the church called to that? Yeah, I'd like to frame up who was he most divisive with? Yes. Yeah, the Pharisees and the religious, the religious people. So let's just be clear. If we are called to be divisive, yes. it's with religious people. So people who are non-religious, who we might deem as lost, or whatever term we tend to use, that's a yeah. pagan, that's a heathen, that's a lost person, they're not awakened, they're closed, whatever terminology we use, yeah. how did Jesus treat those folks? He went and had dinner with them. Yep. He let them wash his feet. Yep. Yep. So, As a matter of fact, the religious people, that made them quite angry, that was a place of division. Right. Most of Christ's division was because he kept loving people that the church didn't want to love. The unlovables. Let's be real clear on where the division came from. Mm -hmm. Can you please stop loving them? Because they're the reason we've been subjected to Roman authority. Let's be clear, culturally, cultural context, do you, the Pharisees were saying, if you have... Um, any kind of, if your body is broken, something's right. wrong with your body, you have a deformity or something else. Well, they saw that as a curse of God. That's the curse of God, and as a result of that curse, the Roman Empire has come and taken us over. So anyone that doesn't fit our purity laws of expectations is a part of the problem. You need to be suppressed and condemned, shunned, Margin. cast to the margins Margin of society. Yeah. Yes. Jesus comes in, and he keeps talking to those people, spending time with those people, healing those people, loving those people, going to dinner with those people, and that's where all the division occurs because Jesus keeps showing love to the people who need it. So yes, let's be unbelievably divisive. Let's love so well that religious people don't know what to do with us. It's, it's, it's it, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think it's the, it's the tension of, <clears throat> we talked about this, we've talked about it, it seems like every time we do this, but being right versus being loving yeah. and, and holding some, uh, if it's, it's one of my, my struggles in, in, in life has been a, where I become the most judgmental. This is where I become, it's not a waitress or a waiter. Um, for me, it's the person that believes they are absolutely right about everything about God. Mm -hmm. I become really judgmental, and mm -hmm. I become very much so um, no compassion for that soul whatsoever. Wow. Why? Because it moves to a place of, in, in my mind, of restricting the mystery of God, but also just the possibility that God could be bigger than they imagine. And they, I find them to be some of the most angry people I know. Hmm which I don't understand. Because if you've got God all figured out, you should be the most loving person I know. And if you've got your theology all lined up, it should manifest itself, not in great. In theory. In theory, it, should, it shouldn't puff you up to make sure that I know I'm wrong. It should puff you up to a place where just love flows from you. Hmm. And I have a hard time. Would it be fair to say, you and I have been in ministry 26 years, 30. Let's just go 30. All right. Um, so um, throw those together, right? You know, 50, 60 years of ministry. Would it be fair to say that the people who you experienced as most kind, most loving, most humble, mm -hmm. actually were really comfortable with the mystery of God? Yeah. And also okay with their own brokenness. Because they see people through the lens of the mystery of God and the love of God because of the amount of love that they've experienced from God. And it, and it, it has transformed their lives and they're willing to say, I, I'm broken. My story, and it's part of what makes journey so attractive to me. 
Would it be fair to say those people, every time they look in the mirror, they're always reminded of the plank? So they actually don't get around to the speck? Could be. The judgment even doesn't happen because they go, right. I know what's here. Right. It's been taken by Christ and resolved, but how do I, I know what was here. Yeah. How do I judge you when the judgment is so, I can, my yeah. sin judges me. Right, yeah. I think, I think the other part of it is, is you begin to recognize um, people who, like, who are quick to anger. They're, they're real quick to anger. Um, there's, there's an unsettledness to their understanding of who God is. If God was quick to anger with us, dang, that'd be a bad place to be. That would be the Old Testament. Yeah, it would, yeah, he's. Which I kind of just stirred the pot there, sorry. Thanks. But, yeah. the, but there's a, anyway. There's, but, and, and, uh, where I'm going with that yeah, is, okay. the Old Testament's a bit of an evolving understanding of God, right? Like, sure. you have these it ancient people. It sets us people, up for grace. It, does. it sets us up They're for grace. They're writing Jesus. down what they believe God to be like. Right. Oh, God, I guess you want me to go in and kill everybody. This is what God said. We're going to do the thing. And then Jesus comes and goes, yeah, you know, you were growing in your understanding of what God was actually telling you to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you God's actually saying this. You thought eye for an eye. I'm going to tell you it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. God is not Zeus, and Jesus becomes the embodiment of this is what it looks like to have God in your midst. Right. And he disrupted the religious order of the day. Yeah. yeah um, is there a difference between how we are supposed to interact with believers and non-believers? What does that look like in a healthy way? I think this, that's a good trailer on the, the back end of this last question. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're meant to look at all people as one. And so I think it's less about is how... Is it because we're not sure? I, who's a believer? Well, who's certainly not that's true, right? Yeah, how we do, can't judge how a do we know heart. who's truly awakened and who hasn't? Yeah, that's right. So that's a great point. Yep. But um, I think there's if, a lot of counterfeits. Yeah, if we're the light of the world, be the light of the world. But yeah. And awaken to your own truth. Awaken to who God is and how He's shining through you. The the challenge with separating the two is it will tend to lead you toward judgment or codependency. But codependency definition is if you're not okay, I'm not okay. So I'm okay. You're you're good. Yeah. All right, good. I'm okay too right now. Yeah, I know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, the but a codependent like so I grew up in a very codependent form of religion. That person is dying, going to hell, and if you don't say something to them, their blood is on your hands. You're responsible for their salvation, and everything else. And this is why there was a massive shift for me in my understanding of God. God is actually going to take care of them. He's responsible for them. I might get to participate in their story. That's good. I would say the difference is that I would would say we ask different questions. If we are experiencing someone that we perceive to be A believer. Somebody is a proclaimed... Or lost, or Un- a proclaimed, unawakened, un- a yeah. proclaimed believer. Like somebody says, "Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a Jesus follower." Gotcha. The questions I would ask of that person are different than the questions I would ask of somebody who said, "No, nah, I'm an agnostic, or I'm yeah. an atheist," or because uh, oftentimes the ones that are, are proclaiming Christ are the ones that slip into religion. Hmm. I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> Trying not to judge here, yeah. Um, but that's that's been so. You ask different. So if questions. somebody presents themselves as being in one position or another, yeah. Yeah. you might ask some different questions. Right. Great. Yeah. And which leads to another one of these questions. Yeah. Um, uh, we don't use the word born again here. Um, I do every time I reference the Nicodemus story. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but among that's because it's written in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a good reason to How use it. How would we? How would Journey quantify the term born again? Someone who is awakened to their identity in Christ. Next question. Next question. <laughs> I thought you'd talk longer than that. <laughs> um, what's some practical ways that we could practice love toward lawmakers? Ooh, that's good, especially because you, like you don't like them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I like they, that question. Okay, they give, Is give, Lori here? Yeah, 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 she was in the first one. Oh, okay. who, who passed, who, they, they give some idea of who passed late term abortion laws or like what happened in New York City. 
it feels oh, like not religious lawmakers. I didn't finish it, but oh, we could do politicians. However, we want to do this, but okay. I think lawmakers oh. just practice. I think that yeah, that's a nice question. It is a nice question. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to believe sometimes. Politicians are people. Like we we need to remember that. You know, sometimes we see politicians in just two-dimensional world, right. and they're people. They're people with their own struggles. Yeah, Characters. they are. Yeah, that's good. So, I don't know. That's a great question. Let's brainstorm about that. How can we love our politicians? I do have a friend of mine in D.C. who told me one day, he said, letter writing's still a thing. Like, if you all write letters to your congressperson, that ha actually carries a lot of meaning and weight. So... Maybe one Sunday we'll just put, bring some stationery and we'll all write letters. <laughs> <laughs> it would be loving. Okay. Marsha, how are the kids? You would have you know, to. How are, like, <laughs> but we would... <clears throat> <clears throat> Unconditional love. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we might want to read some of them before we send them. <laughs> On, on that note. I like, that's a great, I like, let's do that. <laughs> let's not. <laughs> um, that's a similar We're question. really pretty Where much out of time, but try and come up with one more. Okay. I mean, I got some thoughts, but. Yeah, well, um, no, that'd take too long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got some? There's a reoccurring. All right. This this is the if if I have issues with God, like if I'm feel like I'm oppressed by God, or I feel like God is, um, I feel like I'm constantly being taught hard lessons by God, or I blame God for something, or th it seems to be the there's a reoccurring number of them like that. Hmm. How do I sort that out with God? Great, great question. Um, and I, I don't, I wouldn't, I certainly would not have any kind of formulaic response. I would just point us to what I think, the Bible for me is just a, it's, it's an anthology of books that are collected, poetry, history, um, these books, prophecy, these books that are there for us to climb in and see ourselves in the story. And so if you do that, there's a song book in the middle of the Bible called Psalms where, um, so, where many of the writers, David's, David uh, wrote quite a few of them, a guy mm -hmm. named David, but there are other writers as well. And a lot of them are, just like you would as a songwriter today, might write out the struggle and the pain and the feeling that God isn't present, he doesn't see you, this, it's too much, it's too hard. Now David was a warrior, so... He's a warrior poet too. He also, in his songs, there's like, please kill them, wring their necks, and let them bleed all over the mountain. Um, and, uh, and eliminate their genealogy from the earth. Yeah, yeah, yes. like just wipe, wipe everything from the planet. It, yeah. you know, you see, he's really in touch with his emotions. Mm -hmm. But he often, even in the same song, yep. like a great songwriter, comes around to the end and goes, but even if you don't wipe them from the planet, I'll trust you. Mm -hmm. And that's the posture I think that God is calling us to. We're going to sing a song, and one of the lyrics in the song is, you're never going to let me down. And you might go, well, that's not true. God's let me down all the time. Your perception of God has let you down. Mm -hmm. You might even say, mm -hmm. your idolatry of God has let you down. Right. What I mean by idolatry of God is that you're worshiping an image of God against one of the Ten Commandments. You're worshiping an image of God rather than God himself. And when you take that image of God and you project onto it a outcome that you so badly want and you cannot get this image to fulfill it, you hold that against the real God. And in doing that, you build up resentments against God and you cut off your power the to great, resolving it. The great irony is you're judging him and placing yourself in condemnation. Yeah. So, by tough, the way, it's, a tough place to it's hard, it's mm -hmm. really miserable, it's really painful, it's very hellish. And we love you. Mm -hmm. And you're loved. Even if you're full of judgment and spite and resentment and bitterness, or if you're just confused and disoriented, you're loved. Yeah. That's the thing about God is he's beyond all those limitations of man. And the posture that he keeps calling us back to is a posture of humility that just opens our hands 
And like those songwriters do so often, I'm just speaking primarily from the Psalms here, but they, they, they just happen so much in the Psalms, is they just come back to, even, even when I can't trust you, there's a wonderful song by a couple of our writers here it's called Even If. E- even if this doesn't work out, I'm just gonna still mm-hmm. be present. I'm gonna still seek, I'm gonna still be open. I'm gonna, it doesn't feel like I can trust you, but I'm gonna just place myself in a posture where I will anyway. And even in our rebellion of that, even when we say, okay, God, it's your fault. God, I'm, I'm assigning blame to you for my position in life. I'm gonna assign to you bitterness. I'm gonna assign to you those things. He doesn't abandon you, he's always close. The, it, when we say we trust God in you, there's a, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you and he brings you to life in such a way and he never leaves. He never leaves. Yeah. It may feel like he leaves at time, but in reality what you're doing is you're shutting off all that power that God provides for you as the Holy Spirit resides in you. And so it's really hard to resolve that conflict when, when you're stuck there. And that's why we want people in village. Yeah. That's why we want to be able to say, trust God, trust the Word, because the Word in and of itself is a person as well as the Bible. We've, we, you've got to take these expressions in their entirety and be able to, to really rest in this idea that even my, even my, we all, to some degree, have a limited understanding of who God is. Yeah. And, and we all want to assign to Him things that don't belong to Him in our lives to some degree. It's knowing the unknowable. Yeah. We have to live somehow in that paradox. Right. I have a thought for you. But, but he's good. He's good. Let's yeah. leave it to our contemplation. So would you yeah. bow your heads and close your eyes? This is a place for reflection. I don't want to give you one phrase perhaps in our closing. It's something to comp- contemplate. Again, whatever helps you focus. Where focus goes, energy flows. So, would you place your focus right now, bring it, make sure you're here, present, not in what has to happen later today. If you need to feel your chair, feel the weight of your body in your chair, be present. Here I am, gathered with my church, in this building in Brentwood, Tennessee, in February 2019, like this, here you are. Listen to this statement. Shame leads to isolation. Godly sorrow leads to companionship. If you're aware of your brokenness, and you, and, and you say, part of my struggle, Jamie, is I'm all too aware of it. And I, I don't take the path to conviction and sorrow. I take the path to shame. And the shame gets so strong, I, I can't hold it in anymore. And to let off some of that energy, I shift the blame to other people and sometimes God because I physically cannot contain this amount, this volume of shame. So what would it be like with your awareness of what's broken? Your awareness of the pain, your awareness of the hurt, your hurt, your disorientation, your confusion, the physical thing you're struggling with, the emotional thing you're struggling with, the spiritual thing you're struggling with. What if this morning you might just take a different path and feel sorrow? That means you let yourself feel sad that we live in a broken world, that mankind is often running from God and rather to Him. And would it, would you allow the pathway to stretch out before you and to lead you to companionship? 
might be companionship with people. Maybe God will place a person in your life, or he has, and you just stop seeing them. Maybe you even haven't, you haven't allowed them to share it with you. Perhaps you thought it was too much, or it, it's more heroic to carry it yourself. And, but it's not working, and you know it's not working. Perhaps that sadness might lead you to a deeper companionship, one with, one with God. And if you want to see his true character, then look at the cross, where the world's greatest instrument of torture was transformed into the world's greatest symbol of love. Whatever torture you feel inside, God is the God of redemption. He has the ability to turn it on its head and to use it for his glory. Maybe in your life, maybe it's for the life of someone else, maybe it's for another generation. But that's who he is. And so Father, we speak and sing out what's happening in an internal place. Here are our questions, here are our struggles, and here's our praise. You are God, we are not, and we will trust. 